Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I am the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. I'm excited to be here today with repeat guest and headache medicine specialist, Dr. Fred Cohen. Hi, Dr. Cohen. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you for having me again. Well, thank you for being here. Dr. Cohen is an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's one of our favorite guests. We always have a lot of fun with him and we learn so much. Our episode today is about weather and migraine. This is a really, really common thing to talk about. Everyone always wants to hear why they're triggered, when the weather changes, et cetera. Dr. Cohen is an author on some of the new data that we're going to discuss. And we're gonna talk about what's known, what we feel when the weather changes. So everybody just tune in and settle in and listen to what Dr. Cohen has to say. Let's begin by asking, is the association between migraine and weather changes real? I mean, it feels like it is, but it also feels like it might not be because it's not the same for every one of us. It's not even the same for each of us all the time. So tell us, is it real? Do we have data to show that it, it really occurs? Absolutely. So yes, I, I would say it's real. This is a very common thing that I hear from my patients and not just my patients in population studies. There's been population studies in the condition of migraine. So I'm back as the late 80s. And as far as triggers, it's been brought up a lot, weather changes. And when we say weather changes, the, you know, we're talking about anywhere from temperature changes, hot to cold, storms, blizzards, heat waves, cold fronts, et cetera. So it's a very, very commonly reported thing in patient, typically in patient diaries, when they, you know, talk about what brings on their headaches, that is a reoccurring thing that's been reported for decades. Hmm. So it is interesting because my son, who's quite young, also has chronic migraine. And I have noticed that he's triggered first if there's a weather change, and then I'll be triggered later in the storm. So I know that we're all quite different. What are the most common weather triggers? Are, are there certain ones that are that trigger people more than others? For example, is wind worse than cold, etc.? So I wouldn't call one the most common, but we do have Several events that are more common than others that I hear from my patients. For instance, storms are really commonly here. Heat waves, cold fronts, blizzards, hail. Those are the ones that are commonly brought up. I have patients who, you know, might be in other areas of the country where it's more common, for instance, to have a stronger thunderstorms and stuff like that. So I wouldn't call one that rain that the, it could be any weather phenomenon, mm. for instance. So I know that many of us will follow barometric pressure changes on our phone or certain weather apps because it is believed that that can be a problem for people with migraine. Is it really due to the barometric pressure changes or is temperature one of the problems? What is the cause? What is the reason that we get migraine attacks related to weather changes? So that is a really really big question that I'll break up in the subways where <laughs> it's sort of both in a way. What I mean by okay, that okay. is that temperature and weather events like thunderstorms are, are, let's say, two different things. What I mean by that is low pressure, high pressure. Mm -hmm. The pressure system is what usually details the, like, let's say, incoming rain, incoming thunderstorm. You go from high to low, et cetera. And then where the temperature, how hot is, how cold it is, might not be as related to that. There's some people like, for instance, you were saying when well, you're somewhat a storm, it might be barometric changes and or your trigger might be related to the temperature. And what that sort of boils down on us, you know, people trying to figure out migraine more is what receptors are involved. And that's something I'm actually working with a group where we're trying to we actually have data that we're examining patients in their headache days with their a, what medication to take and how it's how it's changing whatnot, and also the weather events involved, temperature changes, pressure changes, barometric, barometric pressure, etc. Okay, so different receptors might be triggered based on different variables related mm -hmm. to the weather. Is that what is that what you mean? Right. So I'll give an example. We know, for instance, there are a barrier receptor receptors in our brain. We know mm -hmm. that they respond to the atmosphere readings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the, there is thought behind that, that when there is a barometric change, 
these receptors are activated, they change in some way, and then that somehow might lead downstream to a migraine attack. How so? That's not figured out, but that is postulated. Temperature is similar. We know there are these receptors called transient receptor potential channels. There's a bunch of them. They relate to hot to cold stimulus, et cetera. And we know that those changes can lead to inflammation and pain. So that's why there's a thought that, for instance, that if there's a lot of heat, the heat-related TRP receptor goes off. It does a lot of cold. That related one, even for example, there's actually a company working on a potential migraine treatment targeting TR, TRPM3, which, okay. as I said, all these receptors deal with hot or cold. This one deals with heat. And again, that's the thought that maybe during a heat wave, this receptor is firing off, leading to a migraine attack. Oh, that's so interesting. So my next question was going to be because so many people wonder if I moved somewhere else, would I feel better? Do we know if there are particular areas of the country that are better or worse for people with migraine or might it be different for everyone based on possibly which receptor is most likely to trigger our problem? I've been asked this by patients and I've, I would say I've never told a patient to move because you'll never, mm -hmm. that's a, that's a big thing. You know, mm -hmm. like, all right, uproot yourself financially and all this stuff and go somewhere else. That's a big ask. And I don't have a guarantee. Again, weather related change with migraine is a new area where like scientifically examining. So I'll start with that saying, no, I wouldn't make that as an official recommendation. I've had had patients that brought up, hey, you know, I live in Boston, New York, et cetera. And I moved to California and I noticed that I get less headaches there. And then they have made that move. And also vice versa. I've had people move to Arizona with the anticipation that, oh, there's less rain. I'll be fine with no change. So I'll yeah. never give that as a recommendation to, oh, yeah, move. And I've had patients who said they've done that for eczema and other conditions. For some, it has worked. But to make that a official, you know, recommendation as a physician, as a provider, I wouldn't go to that step. Okay. You were one of the authors on a recent weather and migraine study that was presented at the American he Headache Society meeting. What was the main question or hypothesis? What were they looking for in that study? Sure. So this is what I was alluding to earlier. So myself, and also I want to give a shout out to Dr. Vince Martin, who's the president of the National Headache Foundation. He, mm -hmm. He's my colleague and lead on this. We worked along with Teva for they are the manufacturers of Ajovi, one of the CGRP monoclonal antibody treatments. And we worked with their statistics team looking at data that they obtained through their HALO trials. These were the clinical trials that were evaluating Ajovi for the treatment of episodic and chronic migraine. And they recorded during these trials, actually weather events, weather data. They were recording precipitation, pressure changes, temperature, et cetera. So we were looking at you know, before and after with treatment of Ajovi. And we had like over 600 patients that had daily diary records. And we also had additional weather data as well. And we had it through across the country with the exception of the, not the Pacific Northwest, but like states like Wyoming and okay. Montana. There were none there, which was, we found very <laughs> surprising. Everywhere else we got, that was just like a dead zone. But my point is we had data throughout. And this is something we're still working on. There's a lot of data we're working through. But what we published and presented at the, at the recent scientific meeting for the American Headache Society was we saw that with weather-related events, that there we indeed saw patients before and after treatment were having weather-related headaches, that with treatment of Ajovi from Ezumab, that those decreased. And we also saw that these were related to having an average temperature increase of 10 degrees Fahrenheit, meaning that if it, it was all of a sudden the temperature went up as such, that there was increased risk of having a headache. Okay. There is other metrics we're looking at, such as precipitation, change in barometric pressure, et cetera, meaning I'm not saying this is the only one thus, but this is what we published thus far. Okay, so based on that data and that study, it sounds like we found some success in a decreasing weather-related migraine with preventive medication, what about acute medication? Do we treat weather-related migraine with the same acute medications as every other migraine, or is it treated differently? So I'll say this is, you know, in the end, a migraine attack is a migraine attack, meaning mm -hmm. that, yes, in the end, we treat it the same. If a patient comes to me and tells me, 
I get whether I, you know, if your son was to tell me I get a migraine attack after a storm, then you're going to treat your migraine attack. Unfortunately, we cannot control the weather. Storms will happen. Heat waves will happen. And also there are migraines that will happen without trigger. I get migraine myself and I get them without trigger. So proper acute and preventive medication is still paramount. Of course, we'll work to address triggers, try to minimize triggers, but attacks will happen. One optimal strategy and this has been looked at in the states and also around the country is you know tracking weather i know for instance there was a big study in japan where they had a migraine diary app that specifically warned their users hey there's a storm coming and therefore you know it gave them sort of a heads up oh you know should carry my trip tan or my g pan etc so mm-hmm. always if you feel that weather related events are a trigger for yourself you know make sure every day you check the weather and may, and if the hey it's going to be a storm or something that triggers you you have you prepare yourself and have adequate therapy mhm so are there is there any other interesting weather related information that has been learned recently that we can add it sounds like we've made sure to make sure everyone knows that they're not alone that it's real it's not in their imagination that it can be treated preventively and acutely is there anything else that you feel like people should know before we close today well i want to start on that the my big take and what i'm most excited with our published data and more to come i anticipate there'll be publications and more presentations on the data we're working on is the decrease the minimization of this i can tell you how many patients have, when i when they tell me about oh are they, are they feel weather affects their migraine attacks and i go yeah i know and they're like all my other doctors or providers have been like oh okay like they they've been shrugged off that's a major major component and as mm-hmm. you know we've talked before the stigma stigmatization of migraine is a major issue we have you know mm-hmm. a lot of my patients and i know it's an issue across the not just the country the world is mm-hmm. it, oh they're just having a headache attack migraine is more than that it is a disabling burdensome disease it's the number one cause of disability for women ages 18 to 50 it's a serious issue mm-hmm. and it's been discredited a lot when people say oh yeah it's weather well hey now we're showing data hey no like there's data now there's actual numbers it's not just people reporting it it is more now we have barometric weather related metric numbers to discuss about and I'll give an example of how that can make a difference. It's a common thing now that people discuss, oh, we know opiates, Percocet, et cetera, is bad for migraine. That's been discussed for a long time, but for a long time, it was still given in the emergency room by doctors, even though population studies were saying, hey, it's not good. Finally, in around, I'm trying to think 2018 or so, a group, I actually worked with them at Montefiore. We p- actually published the data looking, hey, look, we took an opiate and a non-opiate and we showed the opiates much worse. What was different? We actually had numbers to back it up and people stopped. Unfortunately, for the scientific community, sometimes you have to show hard numbers to you know, be adequate evidence to make a difference. And that's mm-hmm. what I hope with this is not only now we could show this data to validate this as a trigger, but use it as a springboard for more right. studies to come. For like, hey, you know, because it's not just showing a a result. It's to make a foundation for others to look at this and go, hey, I think this this seems like a legitimate problem. Let's do a study on this. I hope these these publications are are people able to use it to get grants, to get medications approved, et cetera. I I wanted to start the conversation. Right. Well, with invisible illness, data is so important. So I love that you said that, and I love that studies are being done. And thank you so much for being with us today to talk to everyone about this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please join us again for our next episode of Headwise. Bye-bye.